So hello, everybody who um, has joined uh, very promptly. Um, while we're waiting to get started, um, there are demographic questions that um, we'd like people to fill out uh, while we're waiting to uh, start the session. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Um, I am Doug Richman. Uh, I will be moderating this uh, session on basic principles and clinical relevance of the uh, ISUSA update on drug resistance mutations. Uh, this uh, subject is um, very important uh, for the uh, optimal management of uh, of patients and the use of the new drugs that have come along. And we're really fortunate to have two international experts uh, to do the presentations. Uh, Francesca Ceccarini Silverstein from the University of Rome and uh, Anna Marie Vensing from the University um, Medical Center in Utrecht and uh, the University of uh, Witwatersrand in um, in Johannesburg. So um, <clears throat> there's an excellent board that puts together these ISUSA uh, webinars. And um, the uh, financial uh, relationships uh, with uh, companies are um, listed here and available on the website. The ISUSA uh, provides CME accreditation and this accreditation on the, uh, is available for physicians, nurses, pharmacists, and uh, you can claim credit on the isusa.org website. Uh, we're fortunate to have uh, supporters who provide unrestricted funds. And <clears throat> the um, content of this uh, session and all ISUSA sessions um, has uh, no input from the uh, uh, contributors. So in na navigating this activity, uh, we will have uh, poll questions both at the beginning and the end. Uh, and uh, please choose your response and responses uh, will be displayed after the poll closes. Um, for submitting questions, please use the Q&A button. Uh, the usual enthusiasm for these is such that we may not be able to address all, but we'll do our best. And um, the chat is open, but do not put questions in the chat uh, because I'm only able to uh, monitor questions submitted to the Q&A. So we will uh, proceed with uh, our two outstanding speakers. Uh, Francesca uh, will be um, talking about the uh, underlying uh, principles. Uh, for the optimization of, uh, of treatment, the principles of resistance. And then uh, uh, Dr. Vensing uh, will be uh, discussing the ISUSA uh, um, charts and the um, resistance to new drugs. So Francesca, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Richman. It's a pleasure to be here today with you. I will share my slides. 
Okay, so I will speak about uh, the review and update on antiretroviral uh, resistance, uh, and uh, we hope uh, that uh, after this um, activity, the learners will be able to describe the principle and the mechanism of HIV drug resistance and the impact on uh, particular mutations, select appropriate patients for genotypic testing, and describe appropriate initial therapy in the setting of pre-existing viral uh, resistance. These are my uh, disclosure. And uh, we know that uh, the goals of HIV therapy is uh, that we should have uh, durable viral suppression. And uh, we have uh, the FDA guidance, the DHHS guidance, uh, and also the recent uh, uh, YAS-US uh, uh, guidance. So this is uh, what is the goal of the treatment. But we also know that uh, when uh, um, the people living with HIV on ART do not achieve uh, the durable viral suppression, they can develop resistant mutation to one or more components of the regimen. And this is the reason why we are here uh, tonight. So uh, luckily, uh, you know that uh, we don't have, uh, un unluckily, a vaccine against HIV because this virus is very variable. But luckily, we have a lot of uh, uh, drugs uh, that have been uh, developed uh, that uh, can hit uh, almost every step uh, of HIV replication. And we started with the reverse transcriptase inhibitors, the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. The first was uh, Zidobudin. We have nine uh, approved. We have after six uh, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And uh, uh, we have uh, uh, after the, the other class of very important that changed the history of the treatment was the protease inhibitors. And um, also we have uh, uh, the integrase inhibitor that was is a quite a recent uh, class in the last uh, years uh, that uh, can inhibit the integration of the HIV DNA on the host genome. We have uh, uh, the entry attachment inhibitors uh, like uh, Maraviroc, uh, the new drugs uh, that a um, little bit later also uh, Dr. Bensing will speak. Uh, that are very important for the multidrug resistance, uh, imalizumab of fostensavir. We have the fusion inhibitor and uh, also a new uh, mechanism of action, also very important, is the uh, capsid inhibitor, uh, lenacapavir. So uh, the goal is to achieve the viral suppression. Today, we have really modern potent regimen, and at least this is our experience in Italy, that uh, more than 95% of people living with HIV after the first line treatment, achieve, achieve the virological suppression. You can see in the left how is the difference of this achievement during the time. And in the right, you see the experience, drug experience people, more than 20,000 now that are in the ICONA court. And you see that in the beginning, unluckily, how many patients have the virological suppression, minus 50, you see in the light blue, very few patients, and slowly by slowly with improving of our treatment, we have now the majority of individuals are living with uh, HIV uh, below uh, 200 copies. So we, uh, or during this time, since the discovery of um, the first AIDS cases and after the identification, isolation of the virus, we didn't have in the beginning the treatment. After 1987, we have the Zidobudin as the first drug to use as a monotherapy. After there was a development of new uh, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, so we can we were using uh, with a sequential monotherapy. After it was very important the dual nucleo uh, therapy. 1996, we have the first protease inhibitor, so we started with the protease inhibitor, but frequently were sequential monotherapy because the patients have already resistance to the previous uh, drugs and after also with a new non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. So in that period, even if a patient was highly adherent, unfortunately, since the drugs were with low genetic barrier and not so potent, and so we had the problem of sequential monotherapy very frequently, 
we have a lot of selection of multi-drug resistance HIV. And uh, which was the outcome at that time? We knew that the drugs have a very low tolerability, high number of pills, uh, and uh, which was the facing of the clinicians at that time, uh, fighting against uh, opportunistic infection, death, and during the time also the um, side effect uh, like uh, lipodystrophy. In the late uh, 20s, uh, we started to have uh, early initiation of therapy with better treatment, uh, with high genetic barrier. And so today we have uh, very much less selection of resistance viruses, even if patients, when they fail, is depending which drugs they could fail with resistance. But uh, we have improved um, the um, co-formulated regimens in one pill. We have the development of, uh, from 2007, this new class of integrase inhibitors, very important. And from 2018, we have new strategy like dual regimen or long acting. So today the clinician is facing a better, for the people living with HIV, the better quality of life, increasing survival, aging, and comorbidity. So it's very important that for the success of a treatment, uh, this depends on personalized medicine, which depends, of course, on having accurate diagnostic tests that identify patients who can benefit from target therapy. And this is true, particularly also for HIV, where we should have uh, not only the maintenance of the viral, um, excuse me, achievement of the virological suppression, but also the maintenance. And so the durability is the very important uh, uh, concept that uh, is depending from three actors. The patient, of course, the person is living with HIV, that is depending from the adherence and the CD4 levels, and also the drug. The drug that have two components, drug levels, so that can have drug exposure, can provide adverse effect, but also the genetic barrier of the drugs. So the number and type of mutation that are required for resistant development. And after the other actor, very important, of course, is the virus. Virus that we can think about the baseline mutation. Subtypes is not so much influencing, but in some cases for some specific uh, drugs uh, regimens, yes, and we will hear later also. And uh, uh, the resistance uh, mutation that can be transmitted also will be discussed about this. But also it's important the baseline burden, how much virus, uh, high viral load, how much also uh, HIV DNA, that is meaning how many cells are infected. So, of course, uh, all these viral parameters could be very important uh, to, uh, to have a success of all uh, the regimens. HIV, we know, has a signature of a vast genetic diversity, and we have four um, groups and uh, the major uh, group uh, with the nine pure subtypes. Uh, and today we have more than 100 major circulating recombinant forms. And we know that uh, there is a, a high variability, 20, 30% between the clades and intra the clade 10, uh, 15%. So regarding uh, the quasi species is a very important phenomenon when we have a chronic infection, that is meaning that when we have, we have an individual infected for a long time, there is a, a continued evolution of the virus as a result of spontaneous mutations and selective pressure. This is due because HIV is a RNA virus, like all RNA virus, and particularly for the reverse transcriptase uh, enzyme, we don't have the proofreading uh, correction. And so this is the reason that we can have an accumulation of uh, uh, mutations. So when we should do the genotyping resistant testing? So first of all, all the guidelines, uh, uh, different Americans, uh, the, um, the uh, YAS Society, the, um, the DSS, uh, the European guidelines, also the Italian. So all of the uh, guidelines, uh, uh, national, international, European, uh, recommended the, the uh, genotypic resistant test for the choice of antiretroviral therapy in clinical practice, both for the uh, naive patients and the drug treated. So which could be the um, take home message of these uh, guidelines? First, that uh, genotypic test is recommended at entry into care for person with HIV to guide the selection of the initial antiretroviral therapy. And uh, 
genotypic test should not also delay the art initiation. We know that now we started with this uh, uh, procedure to have uh, um, the test and treat that in some country, in some area, you can do similar in the same day, but in Italy, frequently we do after some weeks or one week, two weeks. But anyway, it is recommended that if uh, the, we want to treat uh, uh, as soon as possible, uh, the individuals that has uh, uh, the diagnosis, we could do and after readjust uh, the treatment according to the genotypic test uh, results. HIV drug resistant tests should be performed to assist the selection of active drug whenever a, a person is with a virological failure. Normally, with the no longer acting regimen, we should do the resistant test during that the person is still taking the prescribed uh, medicaments or within the four weeks after this continuation, because we know that after the interruption of the treatment, they change uh, the scenario. Another important that whenever we are speaking about uh, failure, and uh, if for, particularly for individuals that have uh, more than uh, history of uh, previous uh, failures, uh, it's very important to uh, do the current drug resistant test, but also to evaluate all the previous resistant tests uh, to be considered for constructing a new regimen, because we have uh, to acknowledge and to know about historical resistant testing for the archived mutation. And uh, the guidelines say that, so the genotypic test is the um, test that we should perform, but in some cases, particularly when we have uh, multidrug resistance, uh, a highly treatment experience, when we have suspected complex drug resistance, phenotypic resistant test is recommended and could um, improve the, uh, the knowledge. Uh, so far, we always uh, did the uh, HIV RNA uh, genotypic resistant test. Now, in the new guidelines, uh, it's also mentioned that, uh, in principle, we can do also the proviral DNA genotyping that can be useful in people with multiple virological failure, unavailable resistance history, or low-level viremia at the time of switch. And these are the guidelines of the European, uh, and uh, you see that uh, still there is a concern about the cautious how we interpret uh, this uh, test, and uh, we could have uh, not always uh, find in the DNA previous resistant test uh, mutations, excuse me, that were um, before in the plasma, or we can detect a clinically relevant mutation. So therefore, routine provider DNA genotype is currently not recommended in Europe. A similar um, message is also in the uh, America, in the HHS guidelines, uh, that is in the last uh, uh, version, where they have a topic, a paragraph, uh, speaking exactly about the optimization on uh, the switching of uh, individuals. Today, the majority of our individuals are with the virological suppression, but many of them have previous uh, failure with previous resistance. So again, also here in the American guidelines, you see that uh, in individuals who have experienced multiple prior failures or have a prolonged history of prior arrangements, or you don't have uh, the previous resistance test, it may be appropriate to utilize provider DNA genotyping test. But also here is very uh, the important message that the results should be interpreted with caution. And so the useful of this essay in the clinic is still under investigation and has yet to be fully uh, determined. So just uh, to remember that uh, in US, uh, particularly for the initial treatment, uh, the um, guidelines recommend to do the resistant test uh, to um, searching for uh, resistance mutation in reverse transcriptase and protease. Only if uh, uh, there is uh, a suspect uh, uh, on uh, uh, resistance also for uh, integrase strand uh, transfer inhibitors, it is uh, supposed to do the resistance test also on the integrase uh, gene. And uh, for the failure, uh, again, normally the first test should be against the reverse transcriptase and protease. And again, of course, if a person fails, and now the majority of individuals anyway are treated with the integrase inhibitors, particularly for the first line, but also, but of course, not all the individuals are treated with the integrase inhibitor resistance, excuse me, uh, drugs inhibitors. But if they are treated, of course, uh, it's very important whenever there is a failure to the integrase inhibitor 
we need to do the integrase uh, resistance uh, uh, test. This is a, a, a new part uh, that has a recommendation in the European guidelines that whenever you, we know that we are using a lot now the PrEP and uh, of course uh, there are individuals that are failing the PrEP and uh, so it's very important to change the PrEP to a triple drug art regimen, including a third drug with a high barrier to resistance. This is our recommendation, uh, the AX. And uh, um, to start uh, and after, of course, uh, to have the resistant test and according to the resistant test, uh, also to adjust uh, the treatment. So if we speak uh, about HIV drug resistance, you see a peak uh, around uh, 2004 to 2015. We had really more than 400 publications per year. So it's a very hot uh, topic. Now there is a little bit uh, decline because uh, uh, but still, we have uh, more than 100 uh, publications each year, okay? Because uh, still uh, the issue of the resistance is important. And uh, if we speak about resistance, what's meaning? It's meaning that we have the virus that is able to replicate also in the presence of the drug. And the emergence of resistance is an inevitable consequence of incomplete suppression of HIV, but this is true also for other virus. And normally we have changes that are in the relevant part of the virus genome mutation. So I like to show this uh, old slide from um, Professor Richman that was for hepatitis B virus, but this is the same also for HIV, for any viruses that uh, if we don't have a good antiviral drug selection pressure, we have always a virus that have some advantage that can survive and will be the fittest. So he, this virus could reproduce, this virus during the production will generate mutation and the mutation will increase the genetic diversity. So we have this increase of quasi-species and so this mutagenesis is replication dependent. So we know that all antiviral drugs normally can select resistance, and this is also due, true in vitro. So how drug resistance arises? Frequently, we can have virus uh, susceptible to uh, the drug, but we can have in some individuals some HIV variant resistance to the drug. And so this is other reason why it's very important to don't use monotherapy. We need always to use uh, uh, drugs uh, that combine uh, more targets. And uh, if uh, we have uh, um, a person that have, even if little amount of resistance uh, variant, of course, uh, um, there will be the selection increase uh, and growth. Uh, and this virus that is resistant will become uh, uh, predominant. And uh, when HIV replication is not completely blocked, when we have, uh, particularly in the past, uh, suboptimal therapy regimens, uh, and we did in the past, uh, unluckily, many first-line uh, monotherapy. And uh, we could have also adherence problem or pharmacokinetic uh, problems. So another important uh, point uh, is uh, that uh, uh, HIV can uh, make an escape to antiviral pressure, not only for the intrinsic property of the virus, but also this depends from the characteristic of the drugs. So we speak about genetic barrier, that is meaning number of mutations required by HIV to develop a full resistance virus. So we have uh, drugs with low genetic barrier, and normally the efficacy of these drugs can be lost by a single mutation or drugs with high genetic barrier, where we have drugs uh, whose efficacy is lost after sequential appearance and selection of a substantial number of uh, um, mutation. So we should remember that the first therapeutic regimen is uh, crucial for the success of the following regimens. And so, of course, uh, we need to limit as much as possible the use of drugs against which the virus has already selected primary mutation. And this is uh, when uh, was uh, uh, the trial for uh, the approval of um, efavirenz. You see that indeed, if individuals have baseline and an RTI resistance, there was a markedly reduced virological response. You see, 9% um, can su have a virological suppression against who didn't have baseline resistance that, of course, achieve virological suppression. So the issue of trans 
meat drug resistance is uh, very important, was in the past, but unluckily is still very important and present. We will see also other new slides. So what we learned from the past also, that uh, particularly NNRTI resistant mutation can persist for many years, okay? And we know that if we start a treatment with a person that have resistance uh, mutation, of course, the response uh, is uh, uh, low, particularly if we have uh, monotherapy, but we, if we receive more than two active drugs, uh, the response uh, is uh, better. In this graph, uh, we have uh, um, cartoons uh, that show us uh, the difference between the acquired versus transmitted uh, resistance. You see that if we have an individual uh, that has uh, wild type viruses, but still quasi species, so not really resistance viruses, if the pressure is not good, of course, we can have a selection and the emergence of resistance variants that will be selected during the therapy. And in the past, when we didn't have the new drugs, we interrupted the treatment to allow the emergence of wild type viruses. And this we found out that in a few months, the virus became uh, as a major population, again, uh, the previous wild type uh, um, origin virus. But if an individual fail a treatment and can uh, transmit the virus, of course, uh, will transmit uh, drug resistance. So we have individuals that have already initial resistance virus. And so the reversion to our wild type during untreated uh, chronic infection needed years. Uh, and this is what we find uh, frequently when we do the resistant test. And this is the reason why we should do the drug resistance uh, at earliest possible when we make the diagnosis. And uh, it is depending if an individual has uh, in the first uh, um, uh, transmission, uh, in the initial uh, phase, uh, of course, we could have more resistance. But if we have a late diagnosis, like with the AIDS already, of course, we can presume that the individual was infected many years before, we could have less uh, uh, resistance to see. So due to the intrinsic characteristic of the virus, uh, we need uh, to uh, remember that uh, um, we need to prevent uh, the emergence uh, of uh, uh, resistance and how the uh, mutation can uh, accumulate. So when we are speaking about drugs with a low genetic barrier, for instance, for NNRTI, the first generation, we know the K103N was a single mutation and in that case, we can speak why this is very fast uh, um, uh, procedure, because we have selection of uh, minor uh, resistance variants that can be already present before. And so a single mutation pre-existing, uh, the therapy, can be selected until uh, uh, inconsistent, inconsistent, we should say, antiviral pressure. So the well type virus will go down while the low amount of the resistance uh, will uh, um, emerge and uh, the virus will be all uh, resistance and uh, we will have the failure. A different is uh, when we are using drugs uh, with high genetic barrier. So it's meaning that we need uh, more mutation. So in that case, we need selection plus generation and this uh, will allow the development of resistance. So here we have uh, um, wild type uh, the virus that could have a minor uh, virus uh, uh, that have a single mutation that is not resistance, but is different from the wild type uh, virus. So if we don't have uh, a really good uh, pressure, all the green, the real wild type uh, will be uh, deleted, but can survive uh, the yellow with a single mutation that will provide an added value. An added value only under the uh, pressure, because uh, without pressure, we'll win in the fitness uh, the wild type. And here, this virus can replicate slowly, and but the fitness is not so good. So it can make another mutation. And after making other mutation, finally, we will have a virus that is resistant that will accumulate the mutations that are necessary to provide a good fitness. And so there will be uh, the failure. So the issue of transmitted drug resistance still persists. And we know from uh, different regions uh, in uh, US and in Europe, uh, we have uh, ranges from four to 19%. Uh, and normally the most common resistance is to nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, particularly first generation of nucleoside reverse transcriptase and after also to PI. Here is a um, 
meta-analysis that show how many studies uh, have uh, published uh, and uh, how many people, you see 32,000 uh, people in um, the period 2014-2019 and more than 40,000 people from 2009-2013. So you see a trend of drug resistance that in some country like in Europe was decreasing, in the United States and North America is increasing, upper income is Asia is increasing, and also in Sub-Saharan Africa is increasing. So this is an important issue. I like very much this slide because these slides say to us, even if an individual has um, transmitted drug resistance, if you choose a correct regimen, so that is all active, according to resistant test, the individual that have resistance will behave. The risk of biological failure is similar to the individual that have no resistance. While if you treat the individuals with the drug, um, that has a, a resistant transmission, not with a full uh, active regimen, this person will have an increased risk of virological failure. And this was true particularly also with the, when you are treating the person with two NRTI and one NRTI, also a little bit you see that there is a, a change even if the fully active regimen was. So, so there was a risk more than if you were treating with the protease inhibitor. So this meaning that we uh, thought that this was associated also with minority variants that could have an impact on virological failure. Today, what about the prevalence of transmitter resistance to integrase inhibitors? Because uh, all guidelines recommend, suggest uh, as a uh, first line uh, integrase inhibitor treatment. And uh, we need to remember that transmitted HIV drug resistance can treat the efficacy of antiretroviral therapy, but also the pre-exposure prophylaxis. The good news that the transmission of HIV with integrase inhibitor resistance is so far a rare event. We don't have a high percentage. So this is our European uh, um, uh, analysis from France, Greece, Italy, Portugal, and Spain. You see that the prevalence of integrase resistance transmitted is 0.30%, while NRTI resistance was around 6%. This is the um, uh, recent data about the uh, US, where you see that uh, um, the, pre the um, resistance to the integrase inhibitors is less than 1%, 0.8, 4% protease inhibitors, 7% uh, NRTI, and 12% for non nucleoside. What is important is that they see, you see in the US, uh, even if the, here yeah, the time is 2018, the last visit, uh, you see an increase of uh, um, the M184 uh, per year, even if it's low, it's less than 1%, but still you see a 12.9 uh, increase. So the conclusion of this paper is uh, that it's very important to continuing the population level monitoring of INSTI and RTI mutation, especially for the M184V that uh, is warranted uh, amidst uh, expanding use of second generation ISTI and uh, uh, PrEP. This is again our Italian data that show how in the beginning, uh, when we didn't have uh, really potent uh, drugs and we used for many years uh, um, sequential monotherapy, the majority of the individuals that fail, fail with resistance, okay? Many three or two classes. Very few patients fail without resistance. Today, the majority of individuals, if they fail, first fail, few failures, and if they fail, the majority of the individuals fail with low risk, no resistance, zero, because we use uh, drugs with high genetic barrier. But still, we can have mutations one class or two classes, and very few with the triple classes. Why is important this? Because in the past, when we didn't have new drugs in 2005, people that have multi-drug resistance to at least three classes have a high risk to death, while individuals that have no resistance or just one class or two classes have a better chance. So this is important that we need to prevent failure. And for this reason, new drugs and new classes of antiretroviral drugs, particularly for high treatment experience, are essential. And 
Again, this showed to us that when we do the resistant test, and if we have, even if we have multi-drug uh, resistant three classes, uh, and we provide a regimen that is fully active, we have a good response. While if we have uh, triple resistance, and unluckily we could not choose a, a proper uh, treatment, we have a higher probability of uh, a virological failure. And uh, another important point is, like also the um, DHS uh, guidelines uh, make uh, now, that we have uh, very frequently switched strategy for virological suppressed people. And so it's very important to know a complete HARV history, particularly with uh, uh, HIV uh, viral load. And uh, we need to think about the duration of viral suppression and the type of mutation, the historical uh, genotypic resistant test. And in some cases, we could also think about resistance detected in proviral uh, DNA when particularly we don't have uh, the information or we know that there is a particularly complex study. So here in Italy, we use, we do a lot of uh, a PBMC uh, genotypic resistance test. And indeed, uh, we prove here that if we combine the interpretation of uh, uh, previous historical resistant test plus uh, the DNA uh, test, uh, indeed, uh, we have uh, a better response uh, to prevent virological failure if uh, uh, comparison, if we just uh, use uh, the uh, previous uh, plasmatic RNA. So we have an experience, we have an increased request of HIV DNA uh, GRT in clinical practice, you see in the years. And this is what we see also that uh, the resistance is quite stable, okay? So you see that around 30% there is any resistance uh, and uh, for each class uh, we have uh, the uh, persistence. So, but what's meaning the persistence of archive resistant mutation? Here is uh, a very elegant uh, first study by the French people that show that if we have in the RNA historical mutation, like for instance, 184B or 41L, you see that uh, in the DNA, after some years, some of that mutation disappear. Okay, this is a DNA level, so you see that some persisted and some uh, disappear. And this has been done with the ultra deep sequencing. And again, this is a recent update of this uh, type of study, where they show that indeed in some individuals the archived M184V disappear, but in other patients this uh, um, there was a persistence, 33%, and the association of the persistence was more on treatment experience patients with longer past replication under uh, 3TC or FNOF, um, FTC, and the lower CD4 nadir and long history of uh, ART. Another important message so of course is uh, how the m 184 v can have an impact uh, on uh, people that switch to uh, to lutegravir 3TC that is a very uh, used now um, treatment and indeed uh, we see that uh, if individuals uh, have m 184 v but in the past more than 3.5 years of viral suppression the risk of virological failure is less than if we have individuals that have in the past M184V, but is less than 3.5 years. So more recent uh, detection of M184V and previous resistance to more than three drug classes were the factors significantly associated with virological failure after switch to dolutegravit 3 tc so my last part uh, is about uh, Sanger or uh, NGS. So, so far we used uh, the Sanger sequencing, particularly on the plasma HIV RNA, and uh, detect a normally mutation with a frequency greater than 15, 20%. So the major quasi species. With the next generation sequencing, we can detect uh, uh, virus uh, and mutation with frequency lower than 0.1%. So what we say as a minor variant. And we know how in the past uh, was very important for the first generation of non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase. So we know now that this ultra deep sequencing can improve the detection of drug resistance also in cellular DNA from HIV infected 
patients with suppressed varemia. Indeed, these are people that have highly treatment experience. So if you see the bulk RNA, the gray lane, are the genotypic uh, historical RNA resistance. And here you see the orange, the ultra deep sequencing, 1% DNA. So you see that at the end, the ultra deep DNA with the minority. So 1% is what is more close to what we find as historical RNA. In the past, we knew several studies that show that NNRTI minor variant had an impact on virological outcome. But now there are different studies on investigating the minority variants on PI. There was no impact on virological outcome on uh, PI and NRTI, few studies and no impact of virological outcome. Now we have more than 25 studies investigating NNRTI art. And so some, like we knew before, had an impact on virological outcome, but not all have an impact on virological outcome. So there is a big debate about the minority variants for NNRTIs, depending also uh, which is the cutoff. So we have also uh, evaluation now, we are thinking about evaluation of transmitted drug resistance by next generation sequencing that could provide an help on global surveillance uh, studies. So um, can be uh, very important. So there is like a, a conclusion that today, particularly low frequency variants uh, can be important, but still uh, we don't know uh, the uh, clinical uh, significance. So my conclusion is that we have the genotypic resistant test that is a corner store very important based on plasma HIV RNA. And we use this for prevention and management of failure of antiretroviral therapy. In individuals under virological control or also with low level varemia, GRT on blood or PBMC, so the DNA at the HIV DNA level can be uh, done, is feasible, and uh, can represent a valuable tool. However, the test is not yet recommended in guidelines because uh, we need still to understand uh, the real uh, clinical significance. We know that next generation sequencing based GRT, uh, GRT testing is becoming the new standard, not only research, but also in clinical monitoring and uh, TDR surveillance. Imagine now that for SARS-CoV, the NGS, allowed to do the SARS-CoV surveillance. So the NGS really now take uh, over and many laboratories are using NGS, at least uh, in Italy and I think also uh, in US. And uh, the NGS and next generation sequencing allow the detection of low abundant drug resistance. However, we still need to define which are the clinical relevant cutoff of minority variants to predict the virological failure. According to the specific mutation, very important is the mutational load, how is the viral load if it's high or low, and different drugs and specific drugs according to the different genetic barrier. Very important is that we have art with novel mechanisms of action that play a critical role of people that are boring multi-drug resistance and uh, Dr. Vensing will speak in a few seconds about this. That is a very important, fragile population, the high treatment experience that has at high risk of clinical progression and death. Another important issue that we have the long acting strategy that uh, is really changing the scenario of treatment and prevention for HIV infection. So we have new drugs and we should always think that we have also an evolution of HRE resistance profile that is follow, of course, improvement in regimen setting. So I conclude acknowledging you for your attention with this very important African proverb that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Francesca, for that um... Terrific presentation of a lot of important information. Um, our next speaker will be Anna Marie Vensing, who will discuss the uh, ISUSA guidelines and resistance to the new drugs. Uh, I should mention that um, the question and answer period will uh, combine the issues of both talks uh, after Dr. Vensing's uh, presentation. So Anna Marie, it's all yours. Thank you, Doug. 
Maybe you can confirm whether you see my slides? We do. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. So here again, I make disclosure, which were already mentioned earlier. And uh, we would like um, to uh, show with this presentation um, some learning objectives. Um, and on completion of this activity, learners will be able to interpret and apply the information as summarized in the 2022 IES USA drug resistance mutations in HIV and utilize the information in these figures for clinical practice. And we would like to start with two um, questions, uh, pre-test questions, and um, I will read them to you. Uh, please fill them out uh, as, you, uh, as soon as possible. And it's about which of the following statements is true. Integrase mutation 74i is a signature mutation of subtype A6 and reduces susceptibility to cabotegravir and the first generation integrase transfer inhibitors, or B, after failure of cabotegravir, will be for in long-acting injectable therapy, integrase mutation N155H with little impact on the second uh, generation instis is selected as a single mutation in the vast majority of cases. Or C, the number of new drugs with activity in the optimized background therapy, but not the genotypic and phenotypic susceptibility scores of the optimized background, was associated with virologic responses rates to fostemsavir in heavily treated individuals. Or D, antelope resistance testing is not yet needed prior to the use of fostemsavir because transmitted resistance had not yet been observed. Or do you think all of these are false? So please fill out. And if you don't know them by now, it's not a problem. Plus, uh, if you pay attention, you probably will be able to do it later. Then we go to the second um, question, um, which is a little bit less extensive. Which of the following statements are true or is true? Lena Kapafi resistance is common in wild type viruses. The M66I capsid mutation was the most frequently observed mutation in highly treatment experienced patients in when we saw a failure of Lena Kapavir. Or no emerging resistance was observed in highly treatment experienced patients uh, with a uh, failure of Lena Kapavir. Or no emerging resistance was observed in drug naive patients in when we saw um, Lena Kapavir failure. Or finally, genotypic resistance testing for Lena Kapavir is not important in clinical practice. So please make your choice. And then we go further, I think. Thank you. So um, at first, I would like to um, really talk to you about the ISUSA drug resistance figures. So why do we have these figures? Well, actually to deliver accurate, unbiased, evidence-based information on drug resistance and to maintain a current list of mutations associated with clinically relevant resistance to antiretroviral drugs with emphasis on clinically relevant. Who is establishing those figures? Well, actually there is a voluntary experts uh, panel which establishes every other uh, two years um, a new um, update. And the next update is expected in the fall of 2024. And here in the upper corner, you can see the illustrious names of my colleagues that all um, are uh, these volunteers. So how do we do this? Well, we select mutations that are consistently associated with resistance and list them on bars. And we add user notes with additional information why these mutations are there and why they're clinically relevant. So which mutations actually come into this list? Uh, how do you make it as a mutation into this list? Well, we use data published in peer-reviewed journals and data from uh, uh, conferences. And reported mutations can be added if they have been identified by at least one, but preferably more of the following criteria. We saw them selected by in vitro passage experiments or uh, confirmed by, and confirmed by um, site-directed mutagenesis. Um, they were um, actually shown in, uh, during susceptibility testing of laboratory or clinical isolates to uh, give resistance. 
Um, they are observed with sequencing um, of viruses from people uh, that experience therapy failure or um, associated studies between genotype and baseline and virologic response in persons exposed to these drugs. Although such an association alone is generally not sufficient. Um, if we have mutations that come up um, in one of these, but not really um, broadly uh, confirmed, we put those mutations at the watch list and then we'll watch them and maybe they make the next update. So how does it look like? Uh, here you see a few pages of these mutation figures with a short introduction. And then you see those bars. And for each drug class, we see different colors of bars. Here you see the nucleoside analogs. And what you can see is there are also bars in gray. These are actually for the old drugs, the drugs that we don't use anymore. We decided to still to list them because you may have people that have been uh, treated for over 25 years, used these drugs in the past, and it may still be important to know which mutations may have been selected during these uh, uh, particular use of these uh, drugs. So that's why we don't remove them from the bars. What you can also see is that some mutations are like bold and some are not bold. Well, why is that? Well, we have decided that mutations can be designated as major and then they are bold or minor and they are not bold. And in general, we can state that major mutations occur early during treatment failure, confer larger reductions in susceptibility and generally do not occur as polymorphisms. There's always exceptions, of course, and one exception is, for instance, the A138 mutation uh, in um, the non-nucleoside nucle class, which is also polymorphic. Then the minor mutations, they accrue after the emergence of a major mutation, confirm some incremental resistance, um, and not always, and may occur as polymorphisms in wild-type virus. Uh, but if they don't reduce susceptibility, they restore um, often um, viral fitness to viruses with resistant associated mutations and in that way contribute to resistance. So why are these charts helpful um, next to the excellent interpretation algorithms like Stanford that we have? Well, the bar and user nodes may assist in assessing which relevant mutations may have been selected considering an individual's history of HIV treatment which is particularly interesting if you have a person who has been treated for a long time and you don't have the genotypic data from all the failures that have somebody experienced in the past. And then you can just look at these drugs and see which mutations may have been selected uh, based on the charge. It's also very nice to look at a glance and see that uh, which mutations may confer cross resistance to other drugs in a class or which drugs should be avoided for clinical use. A very easy, a graphically um, available to interpret. Also important is the summary and the reference of data on the drug resistance mutations uh, charge, which will really help you to guide you to the important um, uh, literature, especially focusing on the clinically relevant resistance. So from some explanation about the IASUSA Figures. I would like to go to this fantastic slide of Sergio Lacuto, which really um, makes a nice summary uh, about four uh, decades of antiretroviral treatment. And we come from a long, uh, uh, far away, from no ART or monotherapy with ACT, toxic high doses, to actually nowadays uh, STR, single tablet regimens, and long acting therapy. And we go from deferred ART in people with clinical problems to rapid ART at time of diagnosis to prevent disease progression and to prevent transmission. So many things have changed in the access to drugs, and that means that also many things have changed um, towards uh, resistance profiles. And therefore, we uh, now would like to deal with three new drugs. We won't uh, touch upon every clinical trial that has been done with these drugs. We really have um, highlighted some data that are particularly interested if you want to look at these drugs and consider resistance. So the first drug that I would like to discuss with you is Ostemsevir. Very exciting because it's a new uh, class of um, antiretroviral action. It's an attachment inhibitors. 
It was approved uh, two years ago by the F of three, uh, four years already, uh, by the FDA in 2020 as a first in class oral attachment inhibitors. And it um, binds to the NFLOC GP120. Actually, not the drug itself binds to the um, viral NFLOC protein, but uh, Fostemsevir is a prodrug, and Temsevir is the actual uh, compound that's active in the body. The drug is licensed in combination with other antiretrovirals only for the treatment of people with multi-drug resistant HIV infection. Uh, luckily, there's no cross resistance to other entry inhibitors uh, because these attachment inhibitors fall into the larger class of entry inhibitors and there is no effect of HIV co-tropism, uh, tropism, co tropism. There's antiviral uh, activity against HIV-1 um, but not to HIV-2, and there's one exception, um, actually subtype crf oa one is not, um, the drug is not active against this subtype. Um, this subtype is very rare in the United States, it's occasionally observed uh, in Europe, uh, but it's very um, frequently observed in Asia. Um, so it depends where you uh, contracted the infection, whether this is uh, relevant information. Also, the drug has a high variation of in vitro susceptibility at baseline. Um, we saw the best susceptibility for subtype B. Uh, there you see that 84% of isolates had uh, are actually susceptible, but still uh, at baseline, about 6% of the viruses have decreased susceptibility uh, to this drug. And that is only for subtype B. The figures for the other subtypes are slightly less uh, favorable. So um, you may have an issue with the drug at baseline for uh, a small group of patients. If we then look at the BRIGHT trial, and we have to remind this trial was a trial in heavily experienced treatment patients. If we look at the randomized cohort where people got eight days of either adding um, fostemsevir or placebo to their failing regimen before switching to fostemsevir with optimized background, then about 85% of people had um, a diagnosis eight, AIDS, 80% 80 have been treated with at least five different regimens, and about a quarter of the people had a CD4 cell count below 20, so very heavily um, exposed and also uh, with advanced disease. And then you see that if you go to the um, treatment efficacy, a little bit over uh, 60% at treatment success with um, a stringent 40 copies of viral load cutoff. If we lower that a little bit and we're a little bit more lenient and we look at 200 copies, the drug seems more successful with 80% of viral efficacy. The non-randomized cohort in which people were actually more advanced and started directly with fosfidemsophia with optimized background, you see about 50% of success. It doesn't really matter which cutoff you use. Interestingly, when we traditionally with these clinical trials see that the activity of the optimized backbone uh, matters. If you look here to predict the susceptibility of the backbone with the GSS score that Francesca already explained in her presentation, you don't see much difference with the activity of the optimized background, either whether you use a predicted genotypic score or you, you look at a phenotypic score. Only if you look at this optimized background regimen and you use the monogram uh, assays and you see which drugs are active in these assays, but also have never have been used by the participants before, you actually start to see some relationship with these new drugs with activity in the backbone and viral efficacy. And then you see that if you have non, no new drugs with activity, actually there's not much expected from fosfidemsevir. And that's the purple line. And you really need at least one active drug to see like in 50% of the people um, some success of um, fosfidemsevir use. I think that's really important information. Then if we look at resistance profiles that were selected, there were some substitutions at the end flop that were associated with decreased susceptibility at failure. But actually, non-response to monotherapy with severe is not really explained um, by um, the presence or absence of these mutations. 
So envelope is a very variable uh, protein. And um, so it's, it's quite difficult to correlate any mutations there with virological response at the moment. So currently we don't have consensus on any signature mutations. And that's why we have no bar listed for fostemsevir in the IAS USA resistance tables. Then we move over to another new drug, which is lenacapavir, which is an attachment inhibitor. Uh, it was approved uh, two years later in 22. It's also a new class, uh, the first of uh, capsid inhibitors, and it's licensed in combination with other antiretrovirals for treatment of multidrug resistant HIV infection. But it's also currently also studied for treatment as prevention and also in antiretroviral naive uh, patients with different combinations. Um, Interestingly, these capsid inhibitors um, act at different start uh, uh, points in the viral life cycle. At the beginning, at nuclear transport, at capsid assembly, but also at virus assembly. And um, what you can see is that the antiviral activity of this drug is very high. It's uh, active in the picomolar range, which is different from the other drugs that are more active in the nanomolar range. Uh, range, the other new drugs. Um, the drug is given initially as oral tablets at three time points, and then you go over subcutaneous injections, which are actually need to be repeated only every six months. Um, it has antiviral activity against all HIV-1 groups and also to HIV-2, but in a little bit lesser extent. If we look at the in vitro work um, of lenacapavir and in vitro selections, we see a group of mutations pop up. And the one that's most important is actually the last one, 61i. A dead mutation only on its own can already induce a high fold of uh, resistance. Um, but in, interestingly, the replication capacity of viruses with this mutation alone is very, very low. So there's a large impact on both susceptibility as on viral uh, fitness. If we then look at the Lena Kapavir monotherapy study, um, what is interesting that, especially in the lower dose, you see an emergence of another resistance mutation, actually 67H, in two participants who had really low doses. And this uh, particular mutation has uh, not so much impact on the uh, susceptibility and also not so much impact on the viral replication capacity. And that's probably why in monotherapy studies with low dose, this mutation is observed first. We then look at the um, clinical trials and we look at the Capella studies. These are also studies in heavily pretreated individuals in both cohorts, the randomized cohort, um, where lenacapavir was initially compared to in um, failing back um, Round, uh, uh, together of, uh, compared to uh, placebo, and people switched after 15 days to lenacapavir with optimized background. Um, we actually see that in those cohorts, uh, patients have very advanced disease, a medium CD4 count of 150 cells, and 22% had even um, a CD4 count, which was even lower. And all had resistance to at least two drugs, from three classes and about half of people had resistance to drug up to all four major classes. Still, we saw in people with no predicted optimized background, an impressive almost 70% um, success, which was higher if there was also at least one active uh, background uh, uh, drug in, in, uh, available. If we then look at both the randomized cohort and also the non-randomized cohort, so the people who did not receive uh, placebo or lenacapavir at the first 15 days um, with their failing background, but immediately switched to lenacapavir with optimized background, we see these cases um, of breakthrough. And actually what uh, is clearly seen that most of these individuals all had the 60i, mutation, but uh, in, in this background, uh, in vivo, all with other mutations uh, accompanied. And a 67H was also observed, but less frequently. Which actually gives a suggestion that uh, next to 66I, you see other mutations emerge, probably 
um, uh, having effect on uh, the replication capacity and improving the fitness of these viruses. If we then look at some data of Atlanta Kappa for in treatment naive, uh, what we can see is uh, it's very effective with uh, together with uh, FTC tough or um, and also later on in in maintenance. We only saw two breakthroughs of uh, Lena Kapavir, and both of these patients had actually 67H as a signature mutation. So different profile in different populations, and that um, let us decide to come up with this bar listing all the mutations that were observed in vitro and in vivo, but highlighting in bold the most important ones, 66I and 67H. And this bar may evolve if we have more information available from clinical practice. Then I go to the last drug, cabotegravir, not a new drug. Huh? We already had integrase and strength uh, transfer inhibitors, but of course, an exciting new way of delivery um, as um, having um, um, injections instead of oral therapy. Well, this drug has been approved in 21. Um, not only for treatment experience, but also for those that want to use the drug um, as treatment of prevention and PrEP. For those that have been experienced and have HIV already, um, then it's only licensed in combination with Rilpivirin, which is a non-nucleoside um, drug. And for the treatment of people who have um, virological suppression based on another regimen, on a stable regimen and no history of treatment failure and no known or suspected resistance to either cabotegravir or rilpivirin. Uh, the drug can be used with or without an oral lead-in and then uh, thereafter uh, two monthly injections. Uh, the potency is in the nanomolar range and we see activity against all HIV-1 groups and also against HIV-2. If you look at those trials with cabotegravir uh, use um, uh, without rilpivirin for uh, prevention, uh, two large trials, the HP1083 and, uh, in men and uh, trans women and 84 in women, we only see selection of integrase resistance in 83, and those are listed here. And if you just focus on the integrase profiles, you actually see all mutations that we already know for this class. So no new mutations on the block, actually mutations that we already know from the first uh, generation integrase inhibitors that may be selected upon failure of uh, this drug. And here you see it also with the breakthrough infections, which also has, of course, consequences um, for subsequent treatment in the, these people that got infected in this trial. If we then look at cabotegravir as maintenance therapy, and on the left um, graph, you see the FLARE study. And the FLARE study actually um, was in treatment naive individuals that were uh, first given um, uh, dolitegravir for 20 weeks and then switched to cabotegravir rilpivirin as maintenance if they were successfully suppressed. Uh, and the ATLAS study uh, where cabotegravir um, switch was um, compared to continuation of a um, successful antiretroviral regimen. Um, if you look in the FLARE studies, there were three failures, all had a high body mass index, and the 74-1 integrase polymorphism and low drug levels. Then you would think the 74-1 uh, integrase polymorphism is of interest, but if you look at um, the trial, there were 53 participants with 74-1 at present at baseline in integrase, and no failure. So there seems no predictive um, value of the 71. If we look at the failures in uh, ATLAS, actually two of the three failures also had the 741 integrase polymorphism at baseline. So not predictive of failure, but still present in these failures. What does that mean? There has been some uh, really interesting um, work on this in vitro from who? And which is now also published in the um, Journal of Infectious Diseases. And what you see over there is that the 741, which may, which is uh, sometimes present as a polymorphism, actually gives um, um, uh, a greater replication capacity for the virus in the background of resistance mutations. 
And therefore, this mutation may facilitate selection of resistance if it's already present at baseline. And it has no, on its own, no effect on susceptibility to the integrase inhibitors, but may favor selection of resistance uh, in, in particular patients. If we look at um, the weak 152 failures from ATLAS that are a little bit more than the first initial three, uh, but this is also a longer period, of course, of uh, treatment, uh, we see again here in red all the usual suspects. So no new resistance mutations, all the ones we already know uh, from this integrase uh, resistance trans uh, edit, uh, inhibitors. We then um, look at a very interesting multivariable logistic regression that was performed um, for this drug. And we look at the risk of failure in the first year. Actually, there are two fa of three factors are important. Pre-existing lopinavir resistance um, mutations, and this is then mainly looked at Argive mutations in DNA, HIV subtype A6, or a body mass index above 30, if a person had two or more of these baseline factors, there was an increased risk for a virological failure within the first year. Later on, this model was extended uh, on a, a longer time of use of the drug. And then actually what was seen that in this, uh, there's a very low number of people that actually experienced uh, treatment failure with maintenance of carbotegravir ropifarin, a little bit over 1%. But uh, there were a few factors that lead to an increased risk that were pre-existing lopinavir resistance mutations that stayed on also in this new model as independent predictor, again, subtype A6. On its own, uh, body mass index was not a driver for virological failure, although in the model it was maintained. Um, but also cap um, ropifarin uh, of capotegravir and ropifarin uh, uh, drug levels were important, and the gap through drug concentrations at week four were actually also predicted uh, to um, be of relevance for virological failure. Uh, it was not maintained in the model, um, but I think it's an important thing to keep in our minds for the um, following slides. Then dosing every four or eight weeks didn't really differ. So whether you gave monthly or two monthly injections was not predictive of failure. And also the 74i polymorphism at baseline was not that important, but subtype A6 was, which is particularly important because in the initial analysis of the trial, um, many of the individuals uh, were um, misclassified or not the individuals, but the viruses. So uh, people with failure were suspected to have subtype A1 um, infections, and later on it turned out to be A6 um, subtypes. And this is important because not all um, inter uh, in internet-based um, subtyping tools are actually capable of um, identifying this A6 subtype. So we would like to advise you, although uh, these tools are not um, edit, um, validated for clinical use and only for resistance, resistance use, we know that Comet from Luxembourg and Gina Tufina from Germany are actually two tools are pretty good in um, identifying A6, while other tools will not identify A6, which may be important if you make um, a choice for using this drug in your patients, especially in areas where A6 is present, and uh, the, the A6 were originally seen uh, mostly in Ukraine and in Russia, but especially because of the war, we see a lot of distribution of these uh, subtypes all over Europe. So where is this all inf this information leading to uh, the carbotegravir bar? Well, as you can see, the carbotegravir bar does not differ that much uh, from the other uh, integrase, um, especially the first generation ones, um, integrase bars, um, because we didn't really see new mutations, uh, but we did see uh, in, during failure, often combination of mutations, 140, 148 were all present, um, 
and solitarily 155. Age was only occasionally seen. Most often was a combination of mutations. Um, in clinical cohorts, this is the last data that I want to share with you, we see actually um, a similar failure rates within the clinical trials. So relatively low uh, after switching to carbotegravir ribavirin, which is good news. But in the Dutch co uh, Athena cohort, we saw some failures of people who were eligible according to the FDA and EMA criteria for using this drug. And I think I want to show these cases because I think they give some relevant information for clinical practice to date. These were five individuals that were actually uh, three cis males, one trans woman and one cis female. They all were affected with subtype B or BD uh, combinations. Um, they had wild type or non-relevant polymorphisms at baseline. Um, and those people were treated for a long time, time. They were on eight on ART for three to 18 years. So a long time, very successfully treated, never ART failure. And only one of those people were ever exposed to NRTIs, but without failure before. The last oral ART were either a dolitegravir or a darunavir-based regimen, and they were long time suppressed. And two people had a relatively high BMI, but in subtype C, this was actually fed distribution only at the belly and not at the injection places. And in subtype E, um, there were long needles um, uh, used because um, the fed distribution was at the site of uh, injection. If we then look at time of failure, we saw failure in these five cases um, in between three to 13 months after start of um, the maintenance therapy with uh, differences in um, um, baseline moderate to very high, but extensive resistance, uh, mostly in both classes, but in one particular case, only in an NFTI classes. And of note, if we look at the carbotegravir and ribavirin levels, it's very difficult to uh, interpret these drug levels. And that was also why they were not included in the prediction model. Um, but if we use the ANRS guidance uh, that has been set up to interpret these levels, we actually see in all these people at least one drug level that was low. Um, assuming that something went wrong, either with absorption or with injection. All cases were actually adherent to the um, injections, but only in case E, there was one injection at week eight, which was delivered two and a half weeks late, which is of course too late. But thereafter, patients were suppressed uh, for a time before failure occurred. There were no relevant drug-drug interaction. So why was there failure? Well, um, patient A had a BMI increase during hormonal transition from um, transferring uh, to from male to woman. So maybe that was a reason in this particular patient. Patient B, we really, there were no, um, any predictive factors at baseline. We have no idea what failure uh, really in this long-term uh, suppressed patient and proved to be very adherent for a long time was actually, why did it go wrong? Um, there was no oral lead in. Um, there was a missed injection maybe. That was something that maybe explained why um, uh, there was failure. Maybe one of the injections was set not uh, well because we don't see carbotegravir resistance, we only see ropiferin resistance. Subtype C had a high BMI, but only abnormal and no other risk factors. So also no explanation there why we saw failure. And um, in subtype D, there was NRTI exposure, but never failure. Patient was suppressed for 13 years, um, so a very long time. We do not really uh, understand why failure occurred. And uh, patient E, had a high BMI, but no other risk factors, one injection delayed, and long needles were used. So um, we don't really see a clear picture why it went wrong. Um, we have to say it had very high impact on patients and caregivers because uh, people were suppressed for so long time. And then suddenly um, they, uh, things went wrong, they selected resistance and limiting their also their, their future treatment options. And only a uh, patient B could really go back to his other regimen or the others that had a severe impact, the, the resistance that was selected. I think this is important to realize 
when you switch people that this could happen even after all these successful years of therapy. So in conclusion, we have new drugs with exciting different modes of action and delivery, offering new opportunities for treatment and prevention, especially they like kappa fear and um, um, uh, kappa fear will also be used um, in, in, in people in the future as uh, more often as prevention. It's really exciting, has a lot of opportunity, but there are also challenges. Um, considering the gen genetic barrier, we do not seem too high for all of these drugs. Um, although they're very potent, uh, one mutation may be enough to, to see failure. Um, the most optimal combinations we still have to figure out, uh, especially for um, um, naive patients. And uh, global subtype diversity, especially A6 uh, for cabotegravir and CRF, AE for uh, um, stem cell fear have impact. And um, this also limits its global use uh, for these drugs. I think the IS USA drug resistance figures are continue as to give us insight in the patterns of clinically relevant resistance and will update only not only using data from clinical trials, but also from clinical practice um, to provide us with new data and will help us to learn to use these um, new drugs, which are um, have a lot of opportunities, but still need to uh, be used with caution, especially in those that have already resistance. And with that, I would like to ask you to save this date, 9 to 11 April, um, come to South Africa, don't stay in the United States of Europe all the time, um, in Africa, there's a lot of things going on, especially with HIV drug resistance. This workshop is going on for 31 years and still has the most exciting date, new data on drug resistance. So we hope to see you there in Cape Town. And then I would like to move to the post-test question. Um, these are the same questions that you saw in the beginning. Uh, now you hear my uh, presentation. And uh, please see whether you would change your uh, answer or maybe keep on your choice already uh, at the beginning. And then I would like to go to the next question. Oh, at first we're going to say what is the correct answer. The correct answer is C. Um, the number of new drugs with activity in the optimized background but not the genotypic and phenotypic susceptibility scores of the optimized background as associated with virologic response to stem severe. Why do we highlight this? We think it's particularly interesting because you need to use this drug with at least new, one new active uh, compound um, that was never used before. And then if we go to the second question. The correct answer here is, um, I'm not going through. This is the second, this is the second question. Please answer again. Okay. Well, here the correct answer is B. And Lena Kappavir resistance is not commonly seen in wild type viruses. Um, 60 i capsid mutation um, was the most frequently observed mutation in highly treatment experienced patients in whom Lena Kappavir failed. So that answer is correct. Um, we saw uh, rarely, but we did see uh, emerging resistance um, in the trials with its treatment experienced patients. We also saw it rarely for the naive patients. Um, so uh, although there is um, only one mutation necessary to have a breakthrough, because of the fitness effect, it's probably uh, not very, uh, very often observed. Then the genotypic resistance test for Lena Kappavir may become important um, because uh, the mutation is not seen at baseline. 
uh, and the mutations are selected and we have clearly identified the pattern that's clinically relevant. So upon failure, it is uh, interesting, especially if more compounds may become available in this class to have the availability of resistance testing. So considering the time, I'm not going to all the answers of uh, post-test question one, because I would like to give some opportunity to go to the questions that are maybe available in the chat. And I want to refer back to that. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you, Francesca and Anna Marie. Uh, an incredible amount of, of information well presented. And um, <clears throat> as an indication, several of the questions that were asked early um, have been uh, deleted now that um, you've answered them. And uh, so we have a few minutes for uh, questions and answers, but uh, because we're not going to get through all of them, uh, the uh, the speakers will be able to uh, type answers uh, that are in questions in the Q&A uh, and provide the answers. Uh, to each of the um, people asking questions. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, one question um, for uh, Dr. Vincing, um, just a quick and, and easy one. Uh, does um, uh, it, it, Would you recommend the use of Bictari, uh, I guess, or uh, Dalutegravir in a naive patient infected with a M184V transmitted drug resistance mutation? Okay, that's a um, really nice question. I think we didn't uh, particularly deal with this, but I think considering the high genetic barrier of these um, drugs, if you have solely 141 um, V mutation, you can safely start these drugs, but you also have to realize and to think a little bit about um, why is this 184 V detected? Um, is that really the only mutation that we expect to be present? So look a little bit at the clinical uh, profile and the history of treatment uh, before you take that decision. And a clinical virologist can always help you with that decision. Okay. And um, Dr. Uh, Consigo from uh, Tanzania uh, uh, states that um, in all newly diagnosed cases um, there, uh, they're treated without performing a genetic um Resistance testing. I guess the question is, uh, in in Africa where DLT is now available, whether uh, that precludes the need to do the the testing. Yeah, I think it's a key question from Emily. Thank you for that. I think it's very difficult to see because we know that dolutegravir, um, which is now used uh, in first and second line, is a very um, active drug, a very potent. And that the majority of people that experience therapy failure, there is an adherence issue uh, um, um, for various reasons. And in that perspective, with the high numbers, it's it's very difficult to have the capacity and, 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 and the possibility to pay for all the resistance testing. What we really um, want to um, look into in, uh, in the future is, can we somehow select those that are really adherent to the therapy and prioritize those for resistance testing? Uh, I've done some research on that, and also the WHO is looking into that, whether that would be a possibility to still perform resistance testing, maybe at the earlier phase than now recommended in the guidelines, but also in those particular individuals that would really benefit from the test and also make a wise choice for the resources that are available. Okay, and that relates to the question from Dr. Uh, Osterhout. Um the paradoxical impact of uh, NNR, NRTI resistance mutations on the outcome of second line therapies, I guess, based on the several clinical trials showing that uh, NRTI resistance does not preclude the activity of certain regions. Yeah, and that's, I think it's really interesting. Um, and what you see is that people that have a little bit of resistance do better in the switch trials, uh, probably because the presence of resistance is a proxy for the adherence that those uh, individuals have. Um, I think that's one important thing. We also see that at least at the short term, 
um, some nucleoside resistance will not infer with susceptibility with with success uh, of the uh, dolitegravir regimens. Um, we have to see, of course, which level of NLTI resistance is important in the long term. We do see in people that are on second line uh, ART with dolitegravir and who's of uh, on second line ART and switch to dolitegravir with the unsuppressed viral load that the backbone resistance does matter. So I think we need more data there, but we cannot say that backbone resistance is not relevant. It may be, it depends on the setting and the, and the viral load that started the regimen. Okay, it looks like we're we're getting close to the end and I'd, I'd like to make a couple of closing uh, remarks. So the few uh, unanswered questions here, um, both Anna Marie and Francesca will be able to uh, type answers in response to those. Um, and if we could just move to the closing slides, I would like to uh, thank uh, all of the attendees um, uh, for uh, their attention and uh, uh, hope they enjoyed it. And I want to thank uh, both Francesca and Anna Marie for excellent uh, presentations. Uh, evaluation uh, information on how to claim your CME um, is available on the website. And emails will be sent out to uh, all attendees. Uh, and if you, uh, I'd like to uh, point out to people some other uh, very uh, interesting and exciting um, activities in the uh, ISUSA. Um, Mike Sag, who uh, uh, could have found a career as a uh, a moderator uh, has a uh, um, a podcast uh, that is available through ISUSA website, uh, including some really terrific interviews. Uh, one of which is with uh, Tony Fauci, um, and um, I highly recommend those to you. The next slide. Uh, in the month of February, we have uh, three uh, uh, excellent uh, webinars coming up. Uh, one on substance use disorder. Secondly, uh, Roger Badimo and Connie Benson on uh, a lot of new information in February uh, 20th. And finally, uh, an outstanding speaker, uh, uh, Jason Zucker on MPOX uh, on uh, Leap Day. Next slide. Uh, we have uh, three uh, in-person meetings, uh, one in New York in March, one in uh, Atlanta in April, and one in uh, Chicago in May. And uh, if you can get to those, it'd be well worth your while. I want to thank everybody for their participation and contributions. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>